Hello again, and my name is Bob Cornuke, and welcome to another episode of Prophecy in the News. It's my honor and joy to be the host of this episode. It's a little departure for me. I'm usually the one that's being interviewed. And so I was asked, you know, by Prophecy in the News and Linda to come over here and explain to you some of the things that have happened to me in my life. Uh, sort of a, it's the, the series that we've had is called Lessons from the Ledge. What are the lessons that I've received from looking for lost locations in the Bible? And just as a small recap, I uh, don't want to go over it too many times, but for those of you who hadn't seen the first couple of shows, I am a biblical explorer. Uh, my background, I'm an FBI trained homicide investigator and a CSI guy from being a cop. And I use those skills in trying to find lost locations in the Bible. So I've had this sort of uh, serendipitous journey in my life from being a cop. And now I'm winding up here talking about my searches for lost locations in the Bible. We've had some success. Um, we've, we, I hate to use the term found. God revealed things in his time for his purpose and his glory. So what God has revealed through this effort is uh, I met a guy named Jim Irwin, who's the eighth man to walk on the moon, first one to drive the car on the moon. And we started looking for Noah's Ark. And we talk about those great lessons that I've learned from Noah's Ark. Um, and then we went into talking about Mount Sinai, talking about Moses and being in the backside of the desert where God spoke to him and the lessons that I've learned there. And then we went and we talked about, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. And so now I'd like to talk about a few more of the searches that we've had. And one of them is uh, in the book called The Lost Shipwreck of Paul. And so The Lost Shipwreck of Paul um, is not received the attention that I think it should have. Um, because it's not one of these episodic things like Noah's Ark or Mount Sinai or the Ark of the Covenant. These are all things that we know are kind of relating to Indiana Jones kind of uh, searches. You know, the big takeaways, the big elephants in Bible archaeology are those kind of things that everybody's looking for. But no one was really looking for Paul's shipwreck. And, and, and how I got to look for Paul's shipwreck is I was on an expedition over looking for the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia talked about that last time I have a couple of books on it and a video on it in the lost uh, Ark of the Covenant and do I believe the Ark is in Ethiopia well we're dealing with degrees of probability uh, Mount Sinai is a high degree of probability we have that the Noah's Ark is less much much less degree of probability but the Ark of the Covenant being in Ethiopia it, it could be there we have enough clues in scripture that leads us to believe I believe it, it it probably is there, even more than possibly is there. But I can't make the case right now because it takes me about three hours of going through all the biblical reasons and historical uh, benchmarks that really lead us to believe that the ark have, could, could have been in Ethiopia. But I was over there on a lake called Tana. It's a, what, the second largest body of water in Africa. Uh, lake Victoria being the first, Lake Tana being the second. It's, it's got about 94 kilometers across. It's a big, big lake. You can't even see the other side from parts of it. So I was over there doing uh, going to the islands where they say the ark was hidden on one of those islands in Ethiopia. There's a series of islands on this big lake. And one of these jungle islands over there is called Tana, is called uh, uh, Chana Chirkos Island. And then there's some other islands that we went to. But this day was in the rainy season. And the guy said, you do not want to be on the lake in late afternoon. Uh, and so we had about about a 40 foot uh, steel hulled boat that was kind of from the 1950s old belching boat. And I had my camera crew and we're trying to get this stuff for a documentary we're doing. And we're filming over there and we're seeing the evidence that they have these old manuscripts that go back to 1700 years ago. And they're talking about the ark being there. They have pictures of the the tabernacle being there. And so we believe that the ark came through a sequence of unique uh, journeys from uh, it left the temple during the time of Manasseh, uh, evil guy, uh, horrible guy, came to e Egypt, to, Lake, to Elephantan Island, came to Tanakirikos Island. So we believe that it was one of the stopping points of the ark according to these ancient manuscripts. So we're trying to see if there's any validity to this. So we're on this island over there, jungle island. It was right out of, uh, you know, some some kind of you know, treasure island thing. And, uh, you know, the birds are going, 
everyone it's just 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 real this 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 small group of monks there worship and they worship at a place that they say where the ark was and they have these implements in this big storehouse there these meat forks and bowls and things they say were uh, brought there from when the ark was brought there when it escaped from manassas so we're over there filming this thing and the afternoon's getting late and they're saying we the, the the captain of the boat saying we've got to go and i kept saying no, come on come on there's not a cloud in the sky there's nothing to worry about well i couldn't have been more wrong uh, more stupid because on the halfway back coming back on the boat a storm came up we looked behind us and the wind was chasing across we're about halfway across this lake in probably the the the, the most remote part of the lake you know furthest from land and these big boiling storm clouds these thunderheads started coming after us and boy it was just this black and purple and stabs of lightning were spitting out of it and the wind picked up and then all of a sudden the rain started coming in almost sideways and this thing came across us and all of a sudden the seas rose up from this placid lake to 15 foot swells and it was crashing over the boat and we're going in and and as we're going to shore it's now night and on the shore all the electricity goes out from a lightning that hit hit the shoreline in Bahadar and it, we're going to this just this black inky black and, and, and the, the captain all he had was his compass and he says I hope I'm going in the right direction and he's trying to go to shore because there's no lights and as these this the, the lightning bolts were going all around us in fact they, they were they were hitting off when you hear a, it's like a howitzer when a lightning hits and the, the, the thunderclap just ricochets across that water and so as we're, we're going going to shore all of a sudden the boat rides up on this rock in the middle of the lake we didn't know this was a knuckle of rock kind of like a reef and it rose up in the water and i think the captain knew it was there but he said what are the odds in a, a you know lake that's 94 kilometers across that we'd hit this one place well we hit exactly where this rock pinnacle came up uh, he said it was like a one in a million we hit this thing but we hit it and the boat almost screamed out it's like a like someone screaming out in horror the sound when metal rides up over this this rock that grinding sound and then the propellers hit the rock and the brass propellers just exploded so now we just have no propellers and the water is bashing us up on this rock and water is coming in the boat and we're three and a half miles from shore and um my my partner, uh, uh, Muscana, who was our guide at the time, uh, Ethiopian man, real handsome, ebony black man, real good, we've, we're best of friends now, we've been doing this for a long time. He goes in the back of the boat and I said, well, let's swim to shore, let's get the life vest and we'll swim to shore. Well, there's only a couple of life vests, two on the whole boat. We've got a team of about eight guys. So I give the life vest to the two oldest guys on the boat and I said, well, the rest of us are gonna have to go try to swim the three and a half miles to shore but in a big storm it didn't seem that doable but you know people have un under stress have done some amazing things but as a team leader I'm thinking we're going down uh, the captain's screaming he's running around he doesn't know what to do he's a little, little short little Ethiopian guy and Muscana goes and he sits in the back of the boat and he sits back there and he says he goes um he goes, I, I, I'm going to go down with the boat. I said, well, let's swim. He goes, no. He said, there's hippos on the shore, poisonous snakes, you know, crocodiles. He goes, I'm not going ashore. And he says, I prefer a pleasant death. I'm going to go down with the ship. Well, that's not the words I wanted to hear. So just at that moment, I said, guys, we're going to have to do something. But the first thing we need to do is we need to pray and so we got down on our knees and on that rocking boat you know everything was sliding all over and the the water was coming in and we're starting to go down and and uh, all of a sudden uh, we said let's just pray and so we did and so um, just as we prayed on cue just like in the movies off in the distance comes a little white light a little white light that comes up and over the big swells and we saw it coming towards us and it got more more bright and brighter and brighter until it comes up and we it was a, it was a fishing boat and there was three fishermen on it and it was full of nets 
and corks and hardly any room for us to get in it. But we climbed in this thing and all of us climbed in this boat and we, it was down to just a few inches before the gun walls, the water was coming in. So we got in the boat and we went to shore. And we got to shore, um, you know, a couple of guys started weeping, kissing the ground. Um, this was one of those moments. And so as I was flying back from Ethiopia, I opened my Bible and I started saying, what's the lesson? We're talking lessons this week on what lessons from the ledge. I said, what's the lesson that God's trying to teach me here? And as I'm reading in Scripture, I'm seeing where it's saying in Acts 27 and 28, it's talking about a shipwreck that Paul had. And it was very similar to my shipwreck in that the, the men on board had given up hope. There were 14 days on this boat that Paul was being, I'll, I'll tell you this for Paul really briefly, here, but Paul's coming, he was under house arrest. He wanted to go see, uh, see Caesar to plead his case. He was accused of improper offerings and, and having Gentiles at the, at the temple. So he was brought to Caesarea, spent language in two years there and said, look, I'm a Roman citizen. I have a right to see f f uh, uh, Caesar. So, uh, so he, he had this right to see Caesar. And, and so he was taken on a boat from Caesarea to Sidon to Fair Havens, which is off the coast of Crete. And then they started to sail on again on a bigger ship. They kind of switched ships in Crete and they got on a big Alexandrian grain freighter that brought the, the grain from Alexandria, Egypt to Rome. Rome had a, about a million people at the time. There wasn't another city for another thousand years that had a million people. But Rome had a food problem. They couldn't feed all the people that lived in Rome. So they got their, brought their wheat from one of the provinces uh, the Roman provinces in Alexandria and Egypt, and they were bringing these big grain freighters. And that was for the, the forerunner of the big tankers that we have in the ocean today. That was the first kind of ship ship tankers. They're just full of grain. And so as they're, they're going towards Malta, the Bible says they went down towards uh, Sidon, and I mean da down towards Serta Sands, which is off the coast of Libya, and they turned and they hit the coast of Malta. And the, the Bible says they came... And when they came to Malta, they had been 14 days and night aboard this, this, this boat with a big storm and all had given up hope. But, but Paul uh, had got a message from the angel of the Lord. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But they went to uh, the coastline of Malta. And scripture then that gets very, very detailed here. In fact, there's more verbiage used in the shipwreck of Paul than all the creation account in Genesis. You know, the, the, when Paul was coming and the shipwreck, I mean, you read it, it's just voluminous. And we believe Luke is writing here, doctor, very detailed. And he says, when they approached Malta, they heard the, they heard the, the you know, the, the, the waves crashing. You know, it was just, a, they, they, could, they, could, they knew that they were coming close to the island and so they 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 heard that they were coming close we assume and that's the waves crashing because they heard but then they got scared that they and that they started taking soundings and so they took these lead uh, these lead weights and they threw them over the side and the, the sailors did and they checked the, the the depths of the ocean it went to 120 feet and then they pulled it up and then they dropped it down again and about every six feet there's a knot that's tied on these ropes and they could see uh, six feet as a you know going down how, how deep it is you know and so um they they tipped to our equation it would be 120 feet and then they took the soundings and again found it to be um ni 90 feet and then when they 90 feet they deployed four anchors from the stern now most anchors are from the bow but they wanted to be weather veined in looking at the island so they knew the island was in front of them they deployed four anchors and they set them out. And the, the anchors had lead stocks, these big lead stocks. It looked like a, a navy anchor, but the lead, the crossbar was made out of le, uh, lead, and the the, the vertical uh, uh, bar was in this, and the the flukes were made out of wood, which would rot, and the ropes would rot. But that lead is a high silver content, would last forever, you know, in the ocean. We things erode in the ocean pretty quick, but these lead anchors last for just about ever. So. Anyway, they put these anchors out there and the, the Bible says in the morning when the sun come up, they saw a bay with a beach. And so Luke says, we're going to try for this beach. 
talked about a reef in front of them where two seas come together. The Greek word there is called tapandathalosons, where two seas come together. But all these things the, the Bible was talking about, and as I'm reading this, then they said, and they cut the anchors from the, the stern, and they made for shore, and they, and they went up on this reef. The boat broke up, and then they swam to shore, and they, they escaped. But all this is to say is, the Bible says it's ni- it was n- 120 feet to 90 feet, and then they saw a bay with a beach where a reef was where two seas come together. I mean, the two currents collide together. So I thought to myself, we can find this. I mean, I can go out and find those anchors. Easy. Go over there and find the anchors. So I, I, I went over to Malta, and boy, that Mediterranean Sea is a lot bigger than the little map that was in my Bible. It is immense. It's this massive sea over there. And Malta this is right in the middle of it. Malta is this, this island's about 18 miles long and about 8 miles across. So I landed in Malta and I went out and said, there's no way I'm going to find this, these anchors. But I knew pretty much the general area. So I went to a dive shop there and I asked the guy in the dive shop, I said, hey, I want to know if we can go find these anchors from Paul's shipwreck. He said, well, well, there's a bay that people have been looking. It's even called St. Paul's Bay. I said, well, that's in the north end of the island. The Bible says they went to the Surtis Sands and came up and hit. They would have hit the southeast coast. He goes, well, that's just the traditional view. They didn't know where it was, but that's where they kind of hold it to be. But where do you think it is, Bob? I said, well, I think it's right here. So I took out the nautical maps. I showed him the reef, which is called the Moonshar Reef. It's in St. Thomas Bay. And it's where the two seas come together. And it's 100 feet and 90 feet. And I drew an area about the size of a basketball court. And I said, that's the 90 mark before the reef. That's where it has to be. And this man, Ray Chancho, he looks up. Been a diver for, for since he's been a little boy on the, on the island. He's the guy that owns, it was then the Aqua Bubbles dive shop. And he comes and he looks at me and he said, are you saying that four anchors were jettisoned from here and that the Bible says where they should be. So I read the Bible to him. I showed him my charts. I showed him how I figured it out because I'm an ex-cop. And I said, this is, this is where it has to be. And he goes, he looked like he had seen a ghost. And he goes, Bob, he goes, in the late 60s and early 70s, we brought up four anchors right on this spot. The, I said, anchors, he said, the lead stocks. We brought up. Said after a storm, we saw one. Then we snooped around. Later, we found another. Then there was another. And then another. He said all four anchors. And they were about a 120 foot spread pattern, which means they didn't go down with the hull of the ship. If they went down the hull of the ship, they'd be about 45 feet apart. But since they were deployed, they were, they were, they were wider. So. I said, well, man, I said, you, I, th- I think you might have found the, the, the first things mentioned in the Bible manufactured by men's hands that actually Paul was right next to, maybe even helped deploy them. And Luke, the Bible talks about these four anchors. He said, I, I, he said, it, it's just, it, 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 he said, it just moved him that he could have been involved in such a historical find so i didn't find the anchors these guys these divers these early divers because malta at the the, the time uh, was you know after world war ii there's a lot of tourists that went over there british especially because uh, it had a very prominent uh, place in w- world war ii malta if you read the story it was uh, it was like uh, it was the germans bombed the, the island more than any other place on the planet and the people almost starved to death. The, the, there was a big, great siege there. And so they, they had nothing to eat. But they had, the, they, they had the, the pride of saying that God had the shipwreck of Paul land there. So the four anchors were identified by Anthony Bonanno as being around the first century. He said they could be from Ale- Alexander and Grainford, but definitely around the first century. Had the flourishing period, he said, in the first century. So we have the anchors were identified as being in the exact place of where Luke says. Now, what's the lesson here? 
they were exactly 90 feet, which shows me that Luke was chronically accurate. But then again, the world's not excited about these anchors because they're not related to some big event. But for me, they showed the precision of Scripture. For me, they really moved me. They showed me that this, this is that the Bible can be trusted, that it's prophetically, contextually, and historically accurate in all things. Now, if you want to search for Noah's Ark, you can use the Bible. It's going to be the roadmap. You want to search for Mount Sinai, Galatians 4.25 says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. You want to search there. You want to search for, uh, you know, ridiculous anchors, then go over there. But So we went over, we eventually, uh, one of the anchors, however, was uh, cut in two. Uh, and these, these, these divers said, because it was wrenched in two, which was probably the first anchor thrown out in a storm. And by the way, it was in front of this reef. No ship. We're going to say, well, how do we know it's Paul's ship? Well, no no ship would ever anchor in front of a reef where two seas are coming together and crashing in a storm. Uh, Chuck Missler did, uh, he, the, the late Chuck Missler, he just passed away, a good friend of mine, he said it's 10 to the 50th power that this is anything but Paul's shipwreck. They've never found four anchors in the entire Mediterranean Sea except for, you know, you know needless to say, you know, otherwise, that, that other than Paul's shipwreck that was exactly uh, at 90 feet. So he said that th this had to be that this had to be the place. So for me, the lesson I've learned is that that uh, the, the, the Bible is chronically accurate. Then then what what happened to Paul? Um, we know that Christianity pretty much exploded on the scene after about 60, 62 A.D. Why did this happen? Well, I have a theory. I have a theory that this this shipwreck actually propelled Christianity in a very unique way. People give credit to Paul as being the great evangelist, but Paul, after being on the island and then about three months and then he went to Rome, was under house arrest. And when Paul was speaking under house arrest, there were people that did come uh, to him in Acts 28 and, and heard him preach from sunup to sundown. The Bible says half of them left believing and half of them left non-believing. I thought that's pretty interesting. It's just like our world today. We're divided down a party line in America that half believe this and half believe that. They hear Paul preaching, and I'm sure Paul was a great preacher. I bet he was very convincing, but half believed and half didn't believe. And we have a world today that is in the same place. Now, when Paul was on the ship there was I think it was 270 I think I'm right on that 270 men that were abo aboard the ship now what happened to those men well those men on the ship because they all survived were sailors soldiers there was a centurion named Julius the Roman soldiers they had the owner of the ship was a, 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 you know aristocracy in Rome and you had the uh, prisoners that were being transported to go see Caesar or being transported. So the prisoners were there. Now, what happened to those people? Well, the sailors were sailors. That was their job. And they would continue to be sailors. They'd be assigned to other ships, eventually made themselves to Rome, I assume, and they got another ship and they went out. And they would have sailed to the different provinces of the Romans, all the way to Egypt and all the way to, to England. Same thing with the soldiers. They'd be going off to far off frontiers. The people that were arrested, they would have gone into, you know, other prisons probably. And um, Paul was under house arrest. And then you had the, the man that owned the ship who was a very wealthy guy. If he had that ship, the big, they had made big money off of these grain freighters transferring grain. So he, he would have been a very wealthy guy. So he would have been at talking to the, the higher upper crust of Rome. But in any event, they all saw the angel of the Lord appear to Paul. They all knew on the deck of that ship when the angel appeared to Paul and said, not one here on anybody's head will be harmed. You'll all be saved. Isn't this interesting? That Christianity probably from Paul's shipwreck went out and evangelized the world because these men would have told this story. And then Christianity would have had this sort of this 
viral effect going out after the shipwreck of Paul. So the shipwreck of Paul to me is very special just to conject what 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 it what, what what the story is all about you know these anchors I call them the anchors of hope you know in in your life out there you do have uh, anchors for yourself but they won't hold you have anchors out there that you say well I have money that's my anchor that's not going to hold you have relationships that's an anchor that's that could pull away and hold there's only one anchor in the entire universe that will never pull free. The cables will pull, strain, never break away. That anchor will hold in a storm. That anchor will hold, you're going through the, 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 the water and the storm and the lightning and all that. That anchor will hold. If you put your trust in, the, in God and the God of the Bible and the word of God, you will never, ever have that pull free. The problem today is people have their little anchors out there and those anchors are not going to hold in the storm. They're going to pull free. It's a false security. So I want to thank you for uh, uh, being with me uh, on these last four episodes of Lessons from the Ledge. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed those. It's been my pleasure to give those to you. Before, before I leave you after this series, I would like you to uh, know about prophecy in the news from my perspective. I've known Prophecy in the News going way back to with J.R. Church, who was a, was a friend of mine. This amazing organization. They put out this, this, ma this magazine, Prophecy in the News, great articles. They have just so many great source materials that you can buy in here. I recommend that you subscribe to this. And I also recommend that you be generous in your donations to Prophecy in the News. They're, they're a great organization with great people, and they, and they need your help, as all ministries do today. So... I want to thank you for being with me on this on this this series. It's been a joy for me. And until we meet again, keep that anchor that is the anchor of Christ because it will never pull free. Put your faith in Jesus and you're putting your faith in something that will always, always sustain you no matter what the situation. So God bless and we'll see you soon. There's only one thing more powerful than the Word of God. Jesus says making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down. That's the power of traditions. We need to follow the Bible as it was preached. But when traditions go against the word of God, a huge ax needs to be laid against that root. You are Jew? No. I, I have no time to lose with you. And the problem is we've been tiptoeing around for the sake of all getting along. When I think the Bible is God's words literally breathed upon his pages. The Bible is God's revelation of himself to man. God is the author, salvation is the end, and truth without any mixture of error is the content. The Bible is and shall remain to the ends of the world the supreme standard by which we should live.